shepherd. If you want to get more practical and more, I guess what some preachers would say, more homiletical, you can say that Psalm 22, he died for us. Psalm 23, he lives for us. Psalm 24, he's coming back for us. He's coming for us. Okay? And... Um, it's great how these how these three psalms are are you know, the trilogy of David, and David would have not known you know anything about the crucifixion. He wouldn't have known any because you know you know thousands of years thousands of years before Christ, and the cru crucifixion was not a thing in David's day. Uh, it had to be inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, and uh, but in Psalm 22 we read statements, uh, and we talked about last week about my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we know that was a cry out from Christ on one of the seven, seven sayings of Christ on the cross when he was on the cross of Calvary. And um, Christ spoke, and that, that's, that's found over in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, and uh, also Mark chapter 15 and um, in verse 34. And then when we get to verse 2, we, we see, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, I am not silent. And uh, we see the alternate between light and darkness. And uh, sort of uh, describing perhaps the light and the darkness that took place in the cross. If you think about what happened on the cross, you know it was light. And the Bible says it turned dark. And, you, and so, you know, it could have been the anguish that David, through the Holy Spirit, was emphasizing. He says, oh my God, I cry in the day, but then thou hearest not, and in the night season. And we know that it went dark. During the darkness, Christ cried out the saying in verse 1, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So you see the alternate of light and darkness, and that's found also in Matthew chapter 27. Uh, it's amazing how many, how many times you're going to go back to Matthew. And, 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 and this tells you a lot about Matthew. Because when you're in the Old Testament talking about Christ, you're more, more or less going to go to Matthew because of the fact is Matthew was the gospel to the Jews that about, and it quotes the Old Testament more than any other gospel. And, uh, and so because it was, a, it was a gospel to the Jews and they would have understood the Old Testament scriptures more so than the Gentiles would have. So uh, remember, they're going to talk about, when they write, they're going to talk about things that are commonly known. And uh, just like today, when writers write, they write with common things, they'll just mention them and they don't explain them. And the reason for it is because everybody knows what they're talking about. And uh, so when we get in the Bible and we go back many centuries, sometimes we have to study culture. Sometimes we have to study geography and um, to understand what they were saying and why they said it. Okay. Then when we get down to verses 6 through 8 of, of, of Psalm 22, but I am a worm. Let me stop right there. When you get into the New Testament, you, talk, you, hear, you have in one of our uh, 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 canvases, I guess you'd call them banners that we have here, is I am the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, verse 6. Um, we also know Christ as other I am's. We know him as I am the door. I am the bread of life. You know, so I am, you know, I'm, he, he, he used the term I am a lot. That, that word, that phrase would have been synonymous with Exodus 3 verse 14 where he named himself Jehovah where he says the I, I am that I am have sent thee. Okay, Here in Psalm 22 in verse 6 when he says but I am a worm it's kind of been made, many Bible scholars have referred to verse 6 as the forgotten I am. That uh, as David speaking of Christ the Holy Spirit speaking of Christ, but I am a worm. And, uh, and so we, we see this is the reproach of the people. Uh, he says, but I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Sort of, sort of goes along with what the prophet Isaiah had to say in the, in the, in the prophet Isaiah chapter 53 where it says, you know, who hath believed our report and whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. And then later on in that chapter of Isaiah 53, he talks about he was despised and rejected of men. 
and, uh, and he had no, no uh, comeliness that you could either even see him or look upon him because his visage was so marred. And uh, as Isaiah's picturing that. And here is what verse 6 and then in verse 7, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Does that even ring a bell to many of us? In Matthew chapter 27 and verses 39 through 44, what did the people around the cross say? When he cried out that saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When he cried that out, many around the cross thought he was, you know, crawling out for Elijah or Elijah's. And he said, well, let him come and save him. Let him come and save him. He said, he, you know, he could come and get him. Let him call upon his God. They were mocking him. And that goes right along with the psalmist here in Psalm 22. And then he, and we, go on, we go on down and uh, in verse number 11. We, I know we're jumping some verses, but that's fine. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Now, David would have felt like that. David would have felt like people. He was a reproach. I mean, when the own people in your own government come against you, your own son, that kind of thing, you would feel reproached. And in verse 11, you can see how David would have felt that he was far from him and trouble was near and there is none to help. You would see how that would be. But yet Jesus was that same way. There was no help for him. And, and Jesus fell along. That's the reason when it turned dark, that was symbolic of God himself, the Father, turning his back on his own son. Could not look upon him bearing the sin debt of the world. And so Jesus was alone. Not only did he die for our sins, but he died alone for our sins. And, uh, and, and so we need to understand the conditions of which. But there was no help. Again, in Matthew 26, uh, you, you can see that toward the end of that uh, chapter. Verse 12, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Bulls could refer to Gentiles. Uh, and, you know, and, and, uh, and it could be not only bulls, but yet the bulls of Bashan could be referring to Jews. You, you got this, it's those people that are coming against him, and there's no help to do it. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. A direct correlation to Matthew 27, verse 35, where they're driving the nails in Christ's hands and his feet. And uh, isn't this amazing that thousand years prior to Christ coming that the psalmist wrote about it already. Now, the Jews would have read this. And they would have, you know, prior to Christ, they would have read this and they would have put this in David's life. They would have put that. But yet the, the prophecy that is there. And some may ask, well, why prophesy it? And then it happened in the New Testament. And we have both. And it, I was reading, I say, what's in the old concealed is in the new revealed. One of the best authenticities of Scripture is how part of the Bible, written 400 years apart from the other part of the Bible, can actually answer and, com and, and, and be a commentary on it and bring authenticity to the Scriptures. Remember what Jesus said. He says, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And, uh, and, and the jot and the tittle are the smallest marks of the Hebrew language of a letter. It's the smallest mark of marks. And uh, he says, so it's not, even, not, not, it's not a letter. It's the smallest of a mark, the, the, the very detail. Why did they give him gall to drink on the cross? Because it was prophesied they would give him gall or vinegar to drink that the Scriptures may be fulfilled. If one Scripture wasn't fulfilled, then all would be a lie. But every Scripture has been fulfilled, and only a fool would say that the rest will not be fulfilled. And so, you know, we have no help offered. We have his hands and his feet being pierced. And then in verse 17, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. You know, isn't that amazing that uh, 
as, as his bones. When they would have put him on the cross, they would have nailed him to the cross on the ground, and that massive cross would have been lifted up, and it would have jolted into the uh, hole to hold our, Christ, our Lord up. And, and he would already in a weakened state and uh, already been malnourished, not fed, beaten, and uh, literally skin pulled off the bones. And then when he's dropped, that jolt would actually pull all of his bones out of joint. Think about how it feels. Don't take much to, to if you do it right, to, drop, to put a bone out of joint. And uh, actually, I, I, I picture this, and I don't know that any word description we can give it would give it credence. But yet at the same time, I picture this as the fact that Jesus was beat so bad and he was treated so bad that I believe that, that he was, the, bone, the skin was actually ripped from his bones and there was actually exposed bone that you could see. Imagine it. The Bible says he was marred to the point that you hardly could tell he was a man. And uh, so the descriptions given and pictures that are, are painted have never given what is actually happened. And then in verse 18, they parted, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. In the Gospel of John chapter 19, John records that. In verses 23 and 24, he records them casting lots over our Lord. And, uh, but, you know, as we, as we look at these, these words, he says, I will declare thy name, verse 22, unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. You know, it's, there's, a, there's a shift right there in verse 22. You see that? You, you hear that shift. You go from, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation when I praise thee. Sort of like a shift in the thing that Christ is no longer on the cross, but now he's in the midst of his brethren, symbolizing glory. Go over to Hebrews chapter 2, if you would. Hebrews is another book that's very, very Old Testament oriented. And when I say the Old Testament oriented, it quotes the Old Testament prolifically, and it has a lot of uh, fulfillments of a lot of things of the Old Testament. One of the things talking about mostly is the priesthood and the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews, in verse 11 and 12, it says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I would declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. You notice verse 12 of Hebrews 2 is very similar to verse 22 of Hebrews 22. I mean, of Psalm 22. I would declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst. He calls it the congregation. Hebrew says the church. Will I praise thee? And so we see a shift from the cross to the, uh, you know, dwelling with the brethren and glory and, and, and honor. And then look at verse uh, 24 of, of Psalm 22. For he, have, for he have not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Now, go over to Hebrews chapter 5. And look with me in verse number 7. The Bible says there, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from the death and was heard in that he feared. You see some very similarity between the writer of Hebrews, of which I believe was Paul, who, and the reason I say that, out of all of the New Testament writers, if you look at all the characteristics of the New Testament writers, you know, and there weren't many because Paul wrote over half of the New Testament. And so there weren't very many New Testament writers compared to the, he to the Old Testament writers. But when you compare and look at all of the New Testament writers, to quote prolifically and to go back and grab the types from the Old Testament like Hebrews does. 
and the Old Testament similarities, there would have been no writer among the New Testament writers more qualified to do that than the Apostle Paul. The reason for that was because remember in 2 Corinthians when he gives his uh, credentials, when he said that when he excelled in the Jews' religion above all, he said there was no equal to him. In other words, Paul excelled in the Jews' religion. He was at the top. He knew it all. He lived it, breathed it, and he acted it out by shutting churches down, killing Christians, and teaching and preaching and all that in the synagogue. When he got saved, something happened. When he got saved, he realized then through the Holy Spirit that those Old Testament scriptures that he learned as a Hebrew boy and that he excelled in in his adult life, he saw the fulfillment of it in Jesus Christ. And he pointed it out in the book of Hebrews like no one else could. And I, and I think that's one of the greatest arguments for Pauline uh, 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 you know, authorship of the book of Hebrews. Now, some of you might say, well, I didn't ever know there was a, a, a question. Yeah, there's a question. There's a lot of Bible scholars that do not believe that Paul wrote Hebrews. They, they believe it was written. They don't know who wrote it. They just believe Paul didn't write it. Well, I don't put any credence in that because as I, as I read it, uh, I, I don't believe there's anybody more qualified to write Hebrews than Paul because it, it, as far as Hebrew, he would have known it and square, square down probably better than anybody. As far as Greek, he would have excelled in it. And, uh, and, and Hebrews, it, it, and, it's, and it's complicated Greek too in Hebrews. It's not easy format. And uh, so it's not a John. It's not somebody like James. And uh, or it, it, it had to be a Paul in my opinion. And, uh, and again, I don't believe there was a greater Christian after salvation than the Apostle Paul. I, I, just, I, don't, I don't believe he had an equal after salvation. When he met Jesus, buddy, something happened. Amen? And what, and what a blessing that was. And, uh, but, so we have verse 22. We, we, you know, we have the church. And we started in verse 23 and go to 24 and uh, then look at uh, 25 of Psalm 22, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Question is there to back, could that be a forward to looking to the church? I will pay my vows before them that fear him. I, I believe probably that 20 verse 22 is probably talking more about the church because he's talking about the brethren in the congregation. And then he's talking about Israel in verse 23, in verse 25, he's probably talking through that, he's probably talking about Israel. Because in verse 26, as he goes there, he says, The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek them. Your heart shall live forever. And then in verses 27 through the end of the psalm there, and then he says, All the ends of the earth. So we see all three here. We have to see the church, we see Israel, and we see the other parts of the world. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. So as we read Psalm 22, we have the complete work in the church, in the nation of Israel, and the nations the complete work of Christ, of what he's going to do. One day the nations will look upon him. One day they will believe. In, so, in the book of Revelation, the Bible says that there will be a, na a, a number, a, 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 you know, a, a multitude which no man could number from every nation, tribe, and kindred that will look to the cro Jesus Christ and, 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 uh, and have the mark of God. And, uh, and then I love verse... Uh, 31 because he says they shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this if you look at that straightly in the hebrew right there that last phrase it talks about he has performed this and uh, the other is a prophetic uh, phrase that is used throughout the old testament that and it would go along with the fact he has done this. In other words, the, the another saying of Christ on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. 
Remember that. It is finished. So paralleling Christ's exact words when uh, c completing his complete work on the cross of Calvary. So because of Christ's finished work on the cross, of Cal on the cross salvation has been accomplished to all who come to him and will be saved. doesn't matter who they are or where they're from and all that. So that's Psalm 22, and it's pretty much in its, in, in, in its thing. And then we come to probably, perhaps, the most quoted psalm ever, and that's Psalm 23. I believe Psalm 23 has been used in more funerals than probably John 3.16. Uh, if you go to uh, a funeral home, you'll see it inscribed on the cards that you get all the time. And, and again, very prominent, prominent uh, passage of Scripture. And, uh, and as we think about Psalm 23, I'm not just going to open us up to it, and we'll get into it uh, the week uh, after next perhaps, um, is the fact that, remember, Psalm 22, Jesus died for us, Okay. He's the good shepherd. Remember what John said. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You got the, the great shepherd. The great shepherd is the one who takes care of his sheep. And in Psalm 23, that's what you have. You're looking at it from a shepherd's viewpoint. Okay? A shepherd's viewpoint. And, uh, and that's a, a great way of looking at this book. Now, I have suggested books to you to read. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm from the tobacco sticks of North Carolina. I would have never thought in a million years I would ever tell a congregation what books to read because when it comes to reading, I, when I was in college, goodness, I fought it like the plague. I, I, but you can't get through college without reading, okay? So you're forced to read a lot of things. And I'm thankful that I was forced to read a lot of things because I wouldn't have read them on my own and that's the reason you go to school, right? And uh, I'm going to give you another book to read that it's a great book. I told you already about prayer when we talked about prayer. Anything you can get by E.M. Bounds on prayer, excellent. Okay? You're not going to go wrong with E.M. Bounds. Okay? But you got to watch what you read out there because there are a lot of junk out there. Okay? But these books that I give you are generally old classic standards that are great. Okay, this one here is a great book. The title of the book is A Shepherd's Look at Psalm 23. A Shepherd's Look at Psalms 23. Written by a man by the name of Philip Keller. Philip Keller. Brother John, you might be familiar with that book. And it, it, It's a great book. It's a solid book. And it will bring Psalm 23 to life for you. It is a great book, and, uh, and so I would encourage you. I read it many years ago, uh, and it's, you know, I, I have it somewhere. I don't know where, but I have it somewhere. And uh, so I want to encourage you to, uh, to read that book if you, if you can get it. And, uh, and I want to close with a uh, go back to Hebrews again, and this time chapter 13. And I want us to uh, look. How do we know that Christ is the great shepherd? Now, we know he's the good shepherd because John said the good shepherd does what? Giveth his life for the sheep, right? How do we know Jesus is the great shepherd? Hebrews 13, again, verse number 20 and 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus uh, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. As Paul closes this book of Hebrews he was saying the God who is the great shepherd Jesus Christ who's working a work in you. Psalm 23 is about Christ living in us and through us and how he takes care of us. And when, a couple weeks from now, we'll pick up right there in Psalm 23 and pick that up and go on with that, okay? So I just want to give you that and out of the uh, 
out of the book of Hebrews. Again, you go to Hebrews for the Old Testament. It's an amazing thing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and doing for us, Lord, what we can't get done for ourselves. We thank you, Father, for your, the faithfulness of your people that are here tonight. And, Father, I think of so many that, Lord, ought to be in your house and are not. Lord, for whatever reason, life has gotten in the way. And, Lord, the, I just pray that you'll convict hearts and, Lord, just open up the eyes of your people that they may see, Lord, who you are and what you want to do in them and through them and for them. And I pray that these days of thanksgiving and as we focus on giving thanks, these days of celebrating your birth, I pray that, Father, we again refocus ourselves to you, be faithful to everything and every aspect, grow our church both physically and spiritually. May you receive honor and glory through it all. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Remember men's Bible study tomorrow night, 6.30, okay, in the, in the fellowship hall, all right?